So thank you for coming. Hope you can stay awake just after lunch. Uh, I'm Stuart Sierra, and uh, I work now for Clubhouse. We make project management software. But I'm here today to talk about a topic that I'm uh, a big fan of, and that is homoiconicity. Now, this being a closure conj talk, of course, I need to start with a dictionary definition. So I typed homoiconicity into my dictionary and got nothing. So uh, I started digging around online, and uh, I found a lot of uh, references, a lot of links about this term on this site, the WikiWiki web, or the C2 Wiki. Long before Wikipedia, uh, there was the original Wiki. And this was uh, originally set up for members of the software patterns and agile development and XP, extreme programming, for those communities to share and collect ideas. Uh, it's been running continuously since 1995, and it's kind of a fascinating history of uh, software development methodologies and practices. Uh, so I visited the WikiWiki web and looked for their pages about homoiconicity, a lot of which looked like this. It turns out uh, a couple years ago, the maintainers of the C2 Wiki decided that they were going to rewrite the application as a modern JavaScript full page application with a distributed database backend that would last them for the next 20 years. Uh, as a result, a lot of the pages uh, with some of the older content failed to get ported over. Uh, even the Internet Archive, it turned out, did not have copies of these pages as they existed. Uh, what it did have, uh, luckily, was a bulk archive of the entire site as it existed in early 2015 uh, in a format called WARC, or Web Archive. Uh, this is basically a dump of everything that went over the socket, HTTP requests and responses and even the chunking, uh, as someone crawled the entire C2 Wiki site in early 2015. Uh, so I downloaded this, and there are some tools for working for this format, but I couldn't get any of them to work with just a single standalone file like this. So, of course, I wrote my own. Uh, this is the world's worst HTTP server. It uses a regular expression to parse the request, jump to the appropriate point in the WARC file, and then copy out the bytes exactly as they appeared in 2015. Amazingly enough, this works, and I am all so that I can do this and browse. <laughs> Also, I could browse the WikiWiki web uh, archives about homoiconicity, of which there are many. Um, so the uh, authors themselves had this to say, that there is some debate, some argument about the definition of this term. Boy, is there ever. Uh, so I read all of this, pages and pages of back and forth and people basically having long discussions in wiki text on this site uh, to try to come up with, uh, to see if they'd settled on a, def a definition. And they seem to agree on some things that it's not, just having reflection in your language or uh, being able to bootstrap a language in itself. That alone does not make a programming language homo-iconic. Eventually, they, someone came up with a uh, sort of a challenge or a specification to say this is what makes a language homo-iconic. And this is the example they give in Common Lisp. They say take uh, an expression, uh, in this case set an expression that sets a variable b to 15 and assign that expression to another variable a. And then look at A, evaluate it, look at B, and see the result of evaluating it. Then modify that expression. This car encoder is just common lisp uh, structure. Uh, modify that expression to set B to 37, evaluate it again, and see the result of that. Now, perhaps uh, it might be a little more familiar if I put this in closure. Uh, then this is just doing the same thing, defing a var A, 
to be an expression, evaluating it, looking at the result. And of course, we can't actually modify a list in Clojure, but we can do the next best thing. We can get a new version and redefine A and evaluate it again. Now, another example that the C2 wiki gives is Tickle, or tool control language, a popular early scripting language. And uh, this is the same thing in Tickle, setting A to be this block expression to set B, evaluate it, print the value, and then modify it, set the number to 37. And then this shows here, we don't even have to call eval. In Tickle, if we have an expression in a variable, we can actually use that variable in a piece of syntax, and it will get evaluated. So this is just demonstrating that with a, a dummy conditional expression. And we can see that the value is B. But of course, if you give programmers a challenge like this, they will come up with creative ways to solve it. So someone said, hey, look, I can do this in Java <laughs> by writing a lot of code <laughs> that invokes the compiler and uh, writes out uh, a bunch of strings to a, a file and then compiles it and then executes it. But the end result is the same thing. And so someone did this, and they said, OK, well, therefore, this is proof that Java is also homo-iconic. <laughs> and the response was a resounding no. Um, adding eval to a language, even if it's uh, successful, does not count as homo-iconicity. And you didn't even succeed at that. <laughs> Burn. So <laughs> they sort of end up uh, without a very satisfying answer, they say, well, it's this kind of property, and some languages are more like it with lisp and tickle up at the top, and the C-like languages down at the bottom. But that's, that's not a very satisfying answer. We'd like to make a, a stricter classification. Well, one thing it seems everyone does agree on is the origin of the term, and that is this paper from 1965 uh, by Charles Moores and Peter Deutsch about a system they invented called TRAC. TRAC uh, was designed to be what they called a reactive typewriter, or what we might now recognize as a text editor. Uh, this was still probably 10 years before we had full screen text editors, a la VI or Emacs. Uh, and they were doing this on the PDP-1. Uh, which, as you'll note from this picture, does not have a screen. So they're trying to build a text editor on a machine without a screen. And uh, they wanted to build a sophisticated text editor, a programmable text editor. Uh, so they invented this language called TRAC. Uh, and TRAC is an interesting language because any text that is input to TRAC is just output verbatim. So this is the most boring Hello World program in existence. <laughs> Uh, as a slightly more elaborate example, to escape from the output into the programming language itself, uh, you can write an expression starting with hash paren. So you can see this looks, if you squint, it looks very vaguely Lisp-like. Uh, and I read enough of the manual to figure out roughly what this is doing. Uh, so you can still find the manual for this online, by the way. Uh, again, this was a PDP-1, so they didn't have a lot of memory. Every byte counts, so everything is very short, terse names. Uh, so S means store in this name, FIBO, a block. Uh, e is an equality test on the first argument. If the first argument equals 1, then return 0. Otherwise, if the first argument equals 2, return 1. Uh, then this expression, all the arithmetic operators started with A for arithmetic, so AS is subtract, obviously. Uh, <laughs> subtract 1 from the first argument, subtract 2 from the first argument. R is recall the symbol FIBO, which we are defining, invoke it on that, get the result of each of those, add them together, and you have your Fibonacci function. Um, TRAC uh, was used. It did uh, exist for a while. It was ported to a few other systems. Uh, but it didn't uh, get a whole lot of popularity, in part because uh, 
I believe it was uh, Moore's was very aggressive about enforcing their trademark on the name track, and they threatened litigation against people who tried to re-implement it. Uh, so if you're curious, the only ex extant implementation of track I've found is in uh, Freemax. Freemax is an Emacs-like editor for free DOS, um, and it has its own internal programming language, which looks a lot like track, but it's called Mint, which stands for Mint is not track, <laughs> just to be sure that they wouldn't get into trouble. Um, but uh, you can actually download this, and supposedly it compiles on modern machines, although I couldn't get it to compile. Um, and this is the C syntax indentation function from Freemax. Uh, and you can see it's uh, still a little messy, but at least we have equal signs and plus signs. And I'm not going to go through what all of this does, but uh, if you really want to write track, you can do that. Now, the interesting property of track, which they commented on in their paper, was that the source code form, the way it appears on the screen, should be identical to the form that guides the track processor, which what we would call probably now an interpreter. Um, in other words, the procedures that it evaluates, like that FIBO procedure, are stored in memory exactly as the bytes that you typed. And this is kind of weird when you think about it, since almost every programming language that we deal with always has multiple representations whether it's uh, source code or abstract syntax trees or byte code or whatever, anything that's interpreted or compiled almost certainly has more than one representation. But track didn't. It just reads one byte at a time and decides what to do with it. And so this is where they get the term. They say, because the procedures that it evaluates, and the text of those procedures are the same inside the program and outside the program, it is homo-iconic, same representation. So uh, according to this definition, basically nothing else is homo-iconic, because track is the only language that has this property. Uh, now on this sentence in the paper, which is, as far as we can tell, the first use of this term, they have a footnote. Uh, following suggestion of McCullough WS based on per terminology due to Purse. Now, they spelled his name incorrectly, but uh, as far as I can tell, uh, WS McCullough is almost certainly Warren Sturgis McCullough, uh, an American mathematician uh, who was probably around in Cambridge, around MIT, and that sort of general group of people at the time, although he would have been fairly elderly at this point. Uh, he is best known for writing some of the earliest papers describing the foundations of what we would now call neural networks. He also made various other contributions to computer science. So apparently uh, he was a friend of theirs, he knew what they were doing, talked with them about it, and suggested this term, homo iconic. Which he got from this other person, Charles Sanders Peirce, the C.S. Peirce, uh, who was an American mathematician, and he did some really quite remarkable work. He invented a number of concepts and ideas decades before other people uh, later came across those same ideas and got the credit for them. He was very much ahead of his time and uh, not very successful as a mathematician. Uh, he was slightly more successful as a philosopher, and that's what he was better known as during his lifetime. Uh, he developed a number of important uh, philosophical concepts, including uh, being credited as the founder of semiotics and pragmatism, and also contributing to other fields as well. Uh, so this is from one of his uh, key papers about semiotics. Now, uh, if you've ever had the experience of reading some documentation for some software, and you think, you know what, this is just really terribly written. I can't understand what these people are saying. Why would they write it this way if they want me to understand what they're talking about? Just read some philosophy. You will feel so much better. Um, so this is, this is 
Hearst talking about semiotics, and uh, I'm probably going to butcher it, so I apologize in advance to any philosophy majors in the room. Uh, this being a LISP conference, I know you're out there. Uh, but what I think he's getting at is uh, this idea that there are things you can perceive, whether they're words or symbols, like you see the symbol defun, and that creates an idea in your mind about defining a function, and that idea in your mind refers to some abstract concept or maybe a physical object out in the world. And semiotics was all about categorizing these different forms an idea might take and how they relate to one another. Uh, you can see it obviously has applications to programming since this is essentially what we do all day, creating words and having them mean concepts. Uh, so getting back to track, they had this uh, word, homo iconic, and they had several other things that they cited as inspiration, including commit, which was another early text editing system, and Lisp. Lisp, which had just come out a few years ago. In 1960, John McCarthy published the first paper about Lisp. And if you look at this paper, or if you may have just seen elsewhere, that Lisp looks like this. It was written in M expressions. This was the syntax that McCarthy devised for Lisp as a language that he thought people would actually use. And it has some of the niceties that we expect from languages like uh, algebraic arithmetic and so on. Um, this was given in contrast to the S expressions, which were intended to be the internal representation of the language used in an interpreter or a compiler. But of course, people decided, you know, these S expressions are actually kind of cool, and they're not that much harder to work with than the M expressions. So they never got around to implementing M expressions. And S expressions is how Lisp has been defined ever since. Uh, now, Moores and Deutsch, the track authors, definitely knew their Lisp. In fact, Peter Deutsch was one of the co-authors of the Lisp implementation for the PDP-1 the computer that they were working on. So uh, these folks knew their Lisp, uh, but they weren't afraid of criticizing it. They said, uh, it's, it's kind of elegant, but you know, it's, it cheats a little bit. It has some of the primitives are implemented in machine language, and that spoils this nice mathematical property it has. Um, but if you, know, if you get rid of those ugly M expressions, and you just have the S expressions, and you ignore those machine language procedures, well, then maybe, maybe, it's close to being homo iconic. Uh, so they didn't even quite allow Lisp into their definition. Um, they also said, uh, you know, Lisp is just too hard. Uh, we've tried to read the documentation, and we think our humble text editor users are not going to be able to master this uh, mystique of a language. So here in 1965, I think we have the first recorded complaint about Lisp documentation. <laughs> a few years later, uh, Alan Kay, who uh, would later go on to create Smalltalk and uh, some of the foundations of object-oriented programming. Uh, in 1969, he was writing his PhD thesis, uh, and he described a system called Flex, which, as far as I know, was never implemented, but uh, it had certain interesting properties where you can sort of see the evolution of what would eventually become Smalltalk. And he was also inspired by both Lisp and Track, and he referred to both of them as homo iconic because their internal and external representations are essentially the same. So we're four years in now, and we've already started to muddy what this term means. Uh, but he also said that uh, both of these languages have terrible syntax, that they look like cuneiform. Uh, this is, uh, I believe, the first recorded complaint about Lisp syntax. <laughs> now, uh, because I wanted to be uh, thorough in my research for this talk, I found a copy of that letter. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I couldn't get it to compile. But um, if, uh, if anyone complains about uh, closure syntax, just show them this. See, look, it could be worse. Um, 
So after all this, I'm not sure I was any closer to a concrete definition of homoiconicity. So I did what any developer in 2017 would do. I asked Twitter. Uh, so I put this question out uh, earlier this year, and I got a bunch of interesting answers. Uh, some people gave me the fairly conventional answer, code and data are the same thing, so closure is lists, and this is probably what most people think of. Uh, some people got more into what it actually gives you as a programmer, that if you can manipulate the syntax of the language in code very easily, that is the useful feature of a homoiconic language. Some people got a little more philosophical, said it's balance, parentheses, everything, it's just all, all there. Uh, but I think my, my favorite answer was probably this one. Uh, in the chain of representations between human desire and machine effect. I love that phrase. There's one link where both parties have the same shape. And I like this because this implicitly admits that there are many representations of any language we work with in a computer, from characters to bytes to syntax trees to electrons in registers. All of these things exist, and, but at some point, there is some version where the computer representation and the human representation are the same. So I'll adopt as my working definition uh, this fact that you have to write your code using literal data structures. Uh, and I'll give some examples of what I mean. You have to have data structures built into the language. So Lisp, of course, has lists. Closure has lists and vectors and maps and sets. Prolog has terms. XSLT has data structures. They are XML elements and the components of that. And even more importantly, though, you have to have a reader for those data structures. The fact that I can say, read this string without compiling or evaluating it, just read it and give me a list or a vector or whatever it represents. Being able to do that is a fundamental difference. So to sort of put this in perspective, think of other languages that may have literal data structures. Uh, JavaScript, as an example, has literal objects and literal arrays. There is a syntax for them, and you can read them. We call it JSON. And if we wonder why JSON is so, power, so popular, it's because you can do that. Um, but it's not sufficient. You can't express the entirety of JavaScript, the language, using just the literal data structures. If you tried, you would get something like this. This is uh, AWS CloudFormation, and it is a programming language uh, uh, described in JSON data structures. Uh, but it is very awkward to work with, so much so that they actually replaced this with YAML, which is only slightly better. Uh, because JSON just doesn't have enough descriptive, en enough types, or enough differences of things to make a language out of. So you need these three things, and I will say these are essential properties for a homoiconic language. Uh, but there's still that that loophole, that guy who just wrote eval in Java with a bunch of strings. So I said, okay, I'm not going to count that. Strings and byte arrays, everything could be strings and byte arrays. If we let that be part of the definition, then it just doesn't make any sense anymore. Uh, but then I thought, okay, well, what about track or what about tickle? They were sort of the defining original versions of this property, and they're primarily based on strings and byte arrays. So I'll just grandfather them in. <laughs> they will be allowed to uh, remain. So why do I care about this? Why, uh, why is this so important? Uh, I have a, a problem which is that I love giving conference talks, but I hate making slides. So about every year or two, I try to come up with a way to have a program create the slides for me and put them on the screen. Uh, there have been several attempts at this. This is the latest one. I decided I would represent my slides as closure maps. Uh, and this slide is actually rendering itself, so you could say it's a quine. Uh, 
Uh, some of the slides would have HTML on them. Some of them would be read directly from source code. So this was part of the source code I used to create the presentation. I put some metadata on it that said this function is also a slide. And then I show that uh, with uh, some closure script code. And then I defined my slide deck. I wanted to quickly and easily rearrange all the slides in my presentation. So I thought I'll just give them all IDs and I'll make this tree-like structure with sections and IDs of all the slides. Uh, and this is just closure data. It's Eden data. It is not closure code. I didn't define functions or macros called deck and section. I just read this in as a piece of data. And then I used closure spec to parse it. I think this is one of the interesting underappreciated features of spec is you can make these really great little parsers with it. So I just defined, this is the entire spec right here, uh, a few simple rules about how I structured things in my slide deck uh, data. And I could use conform to turn that into a nested map tree-like structure. And that was a little easier to work with in a program. So I could turn that into datomic data, which I could load into a database, and then write some closure script code to turn it back into HTML. And that is how we get the slideshow. Uh, now, no, 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 no. The truth is it didn't really work that well. And I would, I, I would not recommend this as an approach to making slides. I probably spent 50 times as long making this as I would have in a, a presentation app. But the point is, I wouldn't have even attempted this in any other language. The fact that I could have all these different layers from presentation down to the database and work with them all in the same syntax, sometimes consuming them, sometimes generating them, being able to do that all within one language was what made this kind of thing possible. And I want to contrast this with an approach that is very popular in many languages, uh, and that is embedded DSLs, or domain-specific languages. Uh, I first encountered this idea probably in Ruby. Uh, this is uh, an example just from Active Record, creating a SQL table. But you can find examples of this in almost every modern programming language, uh, especially the more dynamic ones with more flexible syntax. But uh, Go, for example, here's a simpler example from Go that is defining some HTTP routes. And you do run into the same kind of thing. There are embedded DSLs in uh, Lisps as well done with macros. Uh, so you'll see examples of this, things like this in Clojure, where the outer macro establishes some context where the inner macros have meaning. They're effectively creating their own mini language out of macros. But the problem with this, and the thing that I always run into, is that these macros are creating their own language, but I don't get to work with that language. I'm limited to whatever form these expand into and whatever structures that can support. So if I want to put a conditional expression in there, if I want to put a loop in there, can I do it? Who knows? I'd have to study the implementation of the macro and figure out if whatever it's doing is compatible with the rest of the language that I'm programming in. So I think these embedded DSLs are actually quite limiting because they only give you one shot and you cannot build further abstractions on top of them, or at least it's very difficult. Once you have a macro, it's very hard to generate it without writing another macro or something even more complicated. So I would much rather have a system or a library that operates in terms of plain static data structures, because then I can use all the power and utility of the programming language I know to produce that data or consume that data. That gives me many more options for adding different layers of expansion or translation uh, on top of whatever the DSL is providing. Now, I wrote some examples of this uh, in uh, a real system that I worked on. This was an article I wrote for uh, Cognitech earlier this year uh, describing a system we built 
Uh, it was a university uh, course system. The details aren't important, but we had a complex problem, and we decided to use the data features of Clojure to work with it. We created our own language for describing the system in Clojure data, even before we knew all the details of how that system was going to work. And we were able to do that and able to extend this language and map it across many different representations, from database schemas to UI features to documentation, all using the same source data because we got to define how that data would be interpreted. Uh, now, I'm sure you all have your own opinions about what homo iconicity is. You are welcome to argue with me about them uh, at the bar. Uh, but that is it, so thank you all for coming. <laughs>